So good morning. Um, I'm not going to start right yet. He's going to do a sound check and stuff. But I thought before we get started, do you have any questions today that you would like to ask before we um, get going again on new material? Uh huh. Uh huh. Is the is what conserved? The area. Um, yeah, because the um, volume, the the value of the point, the point what what you see is u is a really the average value of u, of u over a, vol, a small width, the volume of the cubicle of the numerical cell. And then its value would be its height. So yeah, it's like the area. Uh -huh. And so when you see your square wave and it starts to spread out, the area should be about the same. And um, so yeah, you should see that. Um, yeah, so that's exactly right. Because, I mean, if we write down our integral for the conservation law, it's basically the area under the curve. So that should be constant. Any other questions? Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. Now, uh, like yesterday, the problem we gave us, we were uh, taking the discontinuity to be at x equal to zero. For the analytic Riemann problem, you mean, or? No, no. Uh, like oh, you mean for the? U L U R the mm -hmm. where the shock is getting formed. Yes. Or is likely to form. X equal to the signing x equal to zero, but actually it need not be x equal to zero. Like yes. That's because you have a Riemann problem at different locations. Right. Yes. So, that, uh, so if I, at every location, if I have x equal to zero, that's all right. Then, uh, yeah. How, how can we justify it? Um, <laughs> you want to solve a Riemann problem here. You want to solve a Riemann problem here and one here, right? Okay. The initial, this is the location of the initial discontinuity. If I write down analytically the Riemann problem, I'm not going to write down the analytic solution three times. I'm only going to write it down once. And I'm going to say that if the initial discontinuity is at x equals 0, then this is the solution, case 1, case 2. And if you want to know the solution of the Riemann problem at the location of the initial discontinuity, you evaluate the solution at x equals 0. Now you come back over here and you say, I want to evaluate a Riemann problem here and find the solution at the initial discontinuity. What should I write down? Well, I come over here and evaluate the analytic solution at zero. Then I do the same thing here. Now this is a brand new Riemann problem. It's not related to that one at all. Brand new Riemann problem, I need to evaluate its solution at the initial discontinuity. How should I do that? I go back to my analytic solution and evaluate it at the location of the initial discontinuity, which for this analytic solution was chosen to be x equals zero. Now I do a third Riemann problem. It's completely independent of all the others. And I need to evaluate its solution at the location of the initial discontinuity. And I come back over here to figure out how to do that. And I evaluated the solution at x equals 0. So someone wrote down the analytic solution one time. And you are just applying it in different places. If you want, pretend that this is x equals 0, and this is x equals 0, and this is x equals 0 for the purposes of the Riemann problem. So the Riemann problem is just a stage in the update. It's not the entire solution. It's just one part of finding the numerical flux. And every time I solve it, it's independent of the other points. OK? If you want, you could just say, we could write this down in terms of some arbitrary x, and it would look more complicated, but you could do that if that makes people, you know, if that's easier to 
to understand. Okay, why don't we... Mm -hmm. um, I'll do boundaries in a moment. Let me see. Well, I'll just go ahead and say now. So boundaries... Um, there's usually a couple kinds of boundary conditions that are chosen. There's the outflow boundary condition. The outflow boundary condition, if I imagine having a big computational grid and I have uh, some fluid and it's traveling to the right, and I want to pretend that nothing physical happens at the boundary, it's just I run out of memory on my computer. And I, or I run out of time, you know, because the larger the grid, the more time it takes for me to solve the problem. Pretend I just run out of time or, or memory, and I want this to be able to keep on going forever. That's what I mean by outflow. And so this would be a boundary condition that allows this pulse to just keep on moving off the grid and never return. For this type of a boundary condition, basically what you do is you want to say that nothing comes in stuff can only leave. And the way that we apply that is this. If these are the points in our grid, um, I'll draw a few more here just for fun. What I do is I take two points on the end, the first two points and the last two points, and I do not update these points with my numerical scheme. You'll see that we you know, don't, if you're trying to update this point with a numerical scheme, you don't have enough information because you don't know what the numerical flux over here is. And so what we do is we t evolve these points here with the numerical scheme on the inside. And then I take this value here and I copy it over here and I copy it over here. And the same on the right hand side. The effect of this is that it sets the numerical fluxes the difference in numerical flux is to be zero. And that allows stuff to come off the grid and usually not to come on. It actually, anyway. And so this is the outflow boundary condition that we apply. Um, it's not perfect. If I have characteristic speeds in my problem that are incoming on the boundary, I can have stuff actually come onto the boundary. Um, but it's, it works well with uh, if the characteristics are moving off the grid, it does allow things to smoothly leave the grid without reflecting. And that's the important thing. So that's one boundary condition that we apply. The second time of, type of a boundary condition, I don't remember what it's called commonly, but it's, it's basically like imagining I have a wall. Okay, so maybe I have a, a reflecting boundary. And when might, you might, when might that occur? Well, if I'm thinking of a problem in spherical coordinates, for example, my point at r equals zero is kind of like a wall. Uh, if something comes in, it goes back out, right? Because I'm restricting r to have only positive values. And what I do here is I imagine that um, the normal components of the velocity change sign as I go through this reflection here. And I basically have to analyze all the variables to see if they're even about this, if there's an even symmetry or an odd symmetry about that plane. And there's a formal procedure for doing this. You formally do a Taylor expansion about the origin and you check to see if the variables change as powers of R or powers, even powers of R. And then you fill in extra <coughs> points over here, again two. by using the symmetries of the solution. So I'm not just copying now over here, but I'm using the symmetries of the solution to fill in two extra boundary points so that I can properly calculate numerical fluxes. So those are the two most common boundaries that you'll find. In astrophysics problems, um, you know, in numerical GR, we usually have a, as large a grid as we can, and we have maybe two neutron stars here going around one another we just put outflow boundary conditions on every boundary. And if I'm looking at a one-dimensional problem with a star, then I'll have an outflow boundary on the right and a uh, reflection boundary on the left.
to for the symmetry in R. Uh -huh. Yes. So um, when you evaluate, go to the next time level in time, if we imagine next level in time is up here, um, I will update this point again using the numerical scheme and whatever points down here I need. And then after all of these points have been updated, I'll copy those values again to the boundary. So every time I do an update, I copy these, this value, the third value, into the first two. And the effect of this is that the difference in fluxes is zero here, which means that nothing comes in. <coughs> Remember when we write down our conservation law, I had a flux from the right and a flux from the left, something like this. And by setting these two equal to one another, the difference in these fluxes at this point here, I think it's that point, or is zero. And so it doesn't allow stuff to come in, is the idea. Are we updating the first two points by the previous value of three, or at the same time? No, the, at the same time. So, so these points are updated. This point is updated. This point is updated. This is like step one. After all of the points have been updated, then the boundary condition is applied. So that at each time, these first two points are always equal to the third one at every time. Yes. You well, you can calculate the flux. You don't need to have a flux. You need to calculate a flux here, but you do not need to calculate one here, right? Yeah. Because that one won't be used. Um, yeah, that's what I want. I want that flux to be zero so nothing comes in onto the grid. Remember my conservation law says that a time change occurs if a flux from the left is present or a flux from the right. By doing this, I'm setting the flux to the left to be zero. And that means nothing comes in from the left. That's actually what I want to have happen. That's what keeps the, the, the that's what I hope prevents stuff from coming in from the, from the left. Because I don't want stuff to come in because I can't control what it might be. Okay. Um, well, let me get started. And I have um, <coughs> several things that I, I, this is our last day, and so the last day is a kind of a combination of everything that we haven't got to yet. And it's a little bit of, bit of a mixture here, but at the end I'd kind of like you to at least have an idea of how if you wanted to sit down and write a relativistic fluid code, what you would do. And so, um, I want to talk about, so far we've only talked about scalar problems like Berger's equation and the advection equation. I want to now talk a little bit about how do I s now extend that to systems of equations. Because the fluid equations are actually five coupled equations. And so I, or in one dimension I have three coupled equations. So now I need to figure out how to solve more than one equation at a time. A uh, second thing I need to thing we hinted about yesterday. I would like to improve the good enough method. It works very well. It's an upwind method, but it's only first order in time and space. And so I'd like to find a way to improve that. I mentioned, we talked about yesterday, improving the reconstruction. So in good enough method, remember we had our uh, function like this. And we thought, well, this point represents the average value in the cell. 
right? And so we could imagine maybe getting a better re uh, representation of the function if I used different slopes maybe like that. And so that's one thing that we'll look at. Another thing we might want to look at is um, speeding everything up. As I said, the good enough, you know, the original method is it's expensive because I have to solve the Riemann problem, and that's hard. And the higher, the more relativistic the fluid flow is, the more dynamic the fluid flow is, it's actually even harder to solve the Riemann problem because these curves that you have to uh, combine into the PV plane, they, they become, instead of nice, simple curves that look like this, they start to look like this. And, uh, or I don't, let's see, that one goes, anyway, you can get very, sharp points that for numerical solvers are hard to figure out where they cross. And so, plus there are a lot of work. And so maybe an approximate solver would help. And there are a couple kinds of approximate solvers that we'll mention. Um, but the idea here is basically speed things up. Because we do a lot of work in solving the Riemann problem to take one value out. All we look at is the value at the, where the, the location of the initial discontinuity. And if we only need one number to come out of the Riemann solution, maybe we can approximate the answer in some way and get something close enough. Um, another thing that we need to do is to figure out how to handle source terms. So far we've only looked at conservation laws where the right hand side was zero. So source terms are in GER, there are many of them. And we need to figure out how to handle source terms and We've only done one dimension, and so extra dimensions, because I need at least three spatial dimensions here. So we'll have to figure out how to do that. Um, a fourth thing. Um, well, I just want to make some general comments about, I'll do that there, I think. And the final thing is basically, what are the, so a simple algorithm for a relativistic fluid code. I just like to kind of, at the very end, we'll go through the steps and we can kind of see how all of the things that we've been talking about hopefully fit together. So that if you wanted to sit down and try this out, you would have a place to start and see how things work together. Okay, so first thing is to look at how do I solve more than one equation at once? Um, the place to begin, of course, always is with linear problems, because with linear problems, we can solve them and we have an idea. Uh, oops, linear systems is what I mean to write. If I have a linear system of equations, I know how to solve that mathematically and analytically. And by using that knowledge, we can figure out maybe a way to do a numerical method that works more generally. So imagine I have a linear system where u is now a vector of variables, okay, and a is a matrix. It's a linear system, so a is a constant coefficient matrix, okay. Um, I'm going to assume that a is, uh, has real eigenvalues. That means it's basically a hyperbolic problem, right? And I'm going to assume that it's diagonalizable, which means that it's um, at least, it's not weakly hyperbolic. And I'm going to assume that the initial data for this system are some u naught of x. If A is a diagonalizable matrix, then I can write this, right? Or equivalently that, where lambda is a matrix of the eigenvalues. And for what I do on the board here, I'm going to assume that these eigenvalues are all distinct, okay? Because that means that it's very simple for me to, um, I have an automatically complete set of eigenvectors with no degeneracies, and that just simplifies what we do here. Um, a can be a function of x, that's correct, yes. Okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to define uh, characteristic variables V um, 
as r minus 1 times u. By the way, the matrix R, I forgot. The matrix R is the matrix of column of eigenvectors written in columns. Like that. So I take the n eigenvectors and I write their components in columns and that is what makes up the matrix R that's used to diagonalize A. And these are called the right eigenvectors because I'm assuming that A acting on a little r i would be a lambda i r i. So A is acting from the right, I mean from the left. The eigenvector is on the right. Um, the solution to this problem can be found by doing this. I'm going to write u in terms of v and put that into this differential equation here. Um, let's see, so this is r times v and I've got an a and I'm going to pull the r through the xv equals zero like that. And I'm going to now multiply or operate on the left by an r minus one everywhere. Notice that I'm assuming that these differential operators in the uh, matrix commute or the, the eigenvectors commute. And if I do that, I get this simple expression here. Where again, this is a diagonal matrix of, of eigenvectors. And what I now have are a set of completely decoupled advection equations. I can write them as a set of scalar equations just by indexing with an I. And this is a problem that we know how to solve, right? V i as a function of x and t is going to be um, v i of x minus lambda i t 0, right? So that's just the, I basically take the initial v and I advect it along um, with the velocity given by lambda i. Now if I want, I can go back and find the problem the solution in terms of u simply by writing the vector r times v. What is, uh, by the way, v x zero? That's what I'm using right here, right? That's v is a function of x uh, evaluated at time zero. Well, that's simply r minus one acting on u at time zero. And so this is r minus 1 u0 of x. OK? So for a linear set of equations, I can diagonalize, I can decouple them using the eigenvectors. And the, and I, and the eigenvalues come out as the coefficients. And I basically go from the coupled system to a set of advection equations. And I just solve them one by one. OK, so that seems pretty straightforward to do. We can solve the Riemann problem now for this set of equations. Um, if u x zero is some u left and u right for x bigger than zero and x less than zero on the left, if I have something like that, um, then I can decompose u l. Do I how much of this do I want to do? I'll do this part here. I'm going to take u l and expand it like this. I 
I'm going to take my two, my left and right states, and I'm going to decompose them into coefficients multiplied by the set of eigenvectors, okay? Then the initial state for V, the reason I do this is to just simplify what V looks like. The initial data for V are simply alpha I and beta I for X less than zero, X greater than zero. So that's the Riemann problem for the scalars. Each scalar characteristic variable has a Riemann problem specified by an alpha and a beta. Okay? Um, we know what the solution is because we've done the Riemann problem for this case. And the solution in time is this. Remember, these are advection equations. Advection equations just, the only thing that matters here is whether or not the wave, the ith wave is moving to the left or to the right, right? If it's waves moving left, then, um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm thinking of the good, good enough method here. I know that the solutions will be either the, the state to the left or the state to the right. I just need to figure out how fast the wave is moving and then compare my x value to the distance the wave has moved. And so I'll get the left state if x minus lambda i t is less than zero. And I'll get the right state if the same expression is greater than zero. So I basically just look at the velocity of each mode. I multiply by the time to figure out how far it's gone. And then I compare the value of x that I, I want to evaluate the solution at. And whether or not it's less than 0 or greater than 0, tell me if I get the left state or the right state. So again, it's just writing down a set of, um, a set of scalar advection equations. And then we're going to combine them together with the eigenvectors. Okay. So if we wanted now, we could just operate with R on here, and we would get U. But I'm going to do something a little bit different here. I'm going to imagine that my eigenvalues are ordered like this, strictly ordered. I've already said they're distinct. Let's require them to be ordered like this so that the smallest eigenvalue is, is 1 and the largest is n. And if I think about this solution, um, and let's say, let's just do a case where we have three, three variables, and so I have three waves, three characteristic variables, three characteristic speeds. They're all distinct. So this would be, uh, this is the wave corresponding to lambda 1, the wave corresponding to lambda 2, and the wave corresponding to lambda 3, okay? Now, if we look at our solution here, and let's figure out what the answer would be right here. I want to find u at this point. Now, this point, if I do um, x minus lambda i t here, well, lambda 1 t is this line right here, right? That would be the distance that this is from the origin. If x is less than that, then it's always alpha i. So the solution at this point here, in term, the solution for u at the left side here would be alpha 1 R1 plus alpha 2 R2 plus alpha 3 R3. And that makes sense because you recognize this immediately as simply the, the left state. And the left state was expanded just in terms of alphas. And we can see here that if I go all the way to the right, here x is larger than lambda i t. So that would be a positive number for all weight modes. And Every coefficient is going to be a beta. And I would again have over here beta 1, R1. Like that. And again, you recognize that as the right state. And the right state was expanded in terms of the coefficients beta. Now we have to figure out what happens in between. Now if I look at this one, I imagine I'm here, OK? So x is larger than lambda 1 t, but it is smaller than the other lambda time t. So uh, lambda, the first one is going to be a beta 1 r1 plus an alpha 2 r2 plus an alpha 3 r3. 
And I'll just do this one. It's the pattern is the same. You can see how it's going to go like that. Okay. The reason I took the time to write all of this down because I want you to see what's propagated along each characteristic. Okay. If you come back and ask in the Riemann problem, what's propagated along this characteristic right here? The thing that is propagated is the difference between beta 1 and alpha 1. So the difference between, um, if I were to write the difference down like this, the difference in the left state and right state. If I take the difference between the two states, the thing that is propagated along the eigenvector, this, the, this characteristic, is the difference beta 1 minus alpha 1. You can see that here because it's beta 1 minus, if I subtract this solution from that one, it's beta 1 minus alpha 1. The quantity propagated along this characteristic is, of course, that, beta 2 minus alpha 2, and the third characteristic is the third difference. Okay. Why might that be interesting? Well, for writing down the, re the solution to this Riemann problem, it's maybe not the easiest way to do it. But when we start doing numerical methods, we're going to assume that usually that the differences between neighboring points are kind of small. And we're going to ask ourselves how the differences between these points propagate from one side to the other. And that's where it will be useful for us. Okay, we can go ahead. So that's the, the Riemann problem for a system of equations. Um, it looks like that. We can, now, we can now say, well, let's use Goodenough's method, and we could write that down. And I don't think I'll do it, but you can um, imagine how it works, right? When we use Goodenough's method, we solve the Riemann problem at every point, and then I evaluate it along the line of the initial discontinuity. In this case, it would be this state here. Uh, if the characteristics were, you know, oriented differently, it might be another state. But I would configure out which state is above the line of the initial discontinuity, and then I would use that as my numerical flux. And you can write that out and, and um, see what that is. But I think that will just, in interest of time, go on. Because we'll see, anyway. So that's an example of how I solve a linear system. What happens now if I have a nonlinear system of equations? If I have a nonlinear system of equations, what I'm going to do is, um, when it comes to solving the Riemann problem, there will be different approaches. But one of those approaches is basically to imagine, um, as I said, between neighboring points, the solution maybe just varies a little tiny bit. And what I will do is linearize the equations about this interface. And I'll solve the linear Riemann problem there. And then I'll use that as part of my update. It won't be the whole update, but it's most of my update. So when we go to nonlinear problems, we imagine the extension from scalar to systems is going to work by linearizing the equations at every point. And things work out nicely to where this is fairly straightforward. And I'll show you an example here a little bit later. So that's the the way that I extend these problems to uh, systems of equations. Let's look at now, kind of change gears and think about the good enough method. So the good enough method is nice because it's an upwind method. It uses the characteristic information to determine what the solution should look like. But it's fairly, it's low order, first order in time and space. We want to find a way to improve that, OK? Let's think about this idea of using a linear reconstruction everywhere. Um, imagine how that might work.
And what I would like to do is imagine I've given some points for a shock wave here or something like this. So I've got a shock wave. I've drawn some points up there. At every boundary between cells, actually, there's no. I'm going to do a, a, a solve a Riemann problem of one sort or another. Um, I don't want to do the constant reconstruction here. So what would be a good way to reconstruct these? The only thing, information you have are these point values. How would you choose a straight line to go through each point, do you think? Hmm? You find the slope? OK. Um, you could calculate the slope different ways, right? I might calculate the slope between those two points. That would be the slope, kind of the average slope, perhaps, at the center. But I really need to reconstruct from the here. And so maybe what I want to do is use these two points to calculate a slope that I'll then use for this middle run here, and I'll reconstruct that line, that point like that. And then I imagine using these two points to get a slope, and then I'll say that's the average slope at that point. And I do the same thing here, but look what happens where, the, where I have like a discontinuity. When I try to find the slope that I use here, I would have a, I'd calculate the slope using its neighbors, and I would imagine now a reconstruction that looks like this. And again, when I come to this point, and I use those two, its neighbors, to calculate a slope, I'll get a reconstruction that maybe looks like this. This is a problem, right? Because I imagine that my solution probably has a real discontinuity and is supposed to look like that. And you saw when we like use lax windriff method or beam warming method with the advection equation, and I had a discontinuity, that the thing they did is they kind of gave a solution that looked like that or maybe like that. They started to get oscillations at the discontinuity. And if I were to use this slope right here, I would have the same problem because this slope that I predict right next to the discontinuity is wrong. I, I have a value here that's above the line where it should be. And this could introduce now one of these peaks like this that causes an oscillation. And so I don't want that to happen. And I want to find a way to prevent that from happening. Um, there are different ways you can do this. But I will take a step back and talk about a concept called the total variation. The total variation is a way to investigate nonlinear stability in, in numerical algorithms. So total variation, well, it's a, the method is a, way to, is a way to impose a stability condition on nonlinear equations. The total variation, usually written as TV, um, is defined as something like a supremum of a, something that looks like a derivative. For simplicity, I'm just going to assume that I have a differentiable function here. If I have a differentiable function, then I could write the total variation as the integral from whatever limits I want to use. And then I would integrate the absolute value of the derivative of the function. And I would call that integral the total variation. So total variation is basically telling me how something changes as I go from one point to point. It's like a sum of all of the derivatives. And if I calculate the total variation on a discrete grid, I simply sum over every point and take the difference of the neighbors, the absolute value of the neighbors. And I just sum over every pair. And that's what I mean by total variation. Now when you solve scalar conservation laws that look like this, <coughs> you can show mathematically that they have some interesting properties with the total variation. For one thing, the total variation never increases. It only stays the same or it goes down. So for example, let's think of the simplest case we could have. Our shock wave, right, for Berger's equation. We just have a 
state on the left, a state on the right, you know that this is just going to propagate unchanged to the right. Um, the total variation, if we imagine these lines are flat, would be zero everywhere except right here. And as this solution, as the shock wave simply propagates with Berger's equation, the total variation would remain constant. Now imagine what would happen if my numerical solution started to do this. That would be the total variation increasing, right? Because now I have extra derivatives between points that, that aren't there in the analytic solution. Another thing about total variation where these conservation laws you can show is that if you have a minimum or a maximum, the maximum or the minimum cannot grow. I'm sorry, the maximum cannot grow and the minimum cannot decrease. Okay, that's part of this idea of when I integrate over this function, it's conserved and I can't just have it turn into something bigger because then I have non-conservation. And so, as I evolve in time, you've seen what happens here. These things usually spread out like that. The area under the curve might be the same, but the total variation usually decreases, right? The derivatives here are all smaller, and the total variation can decrease, but it can't increase. So these observations about this quantity called the total variation led to numerical methods that are called total variation diminishing or usually just written as TBD. And TBD methods, basically, this is something you worry about when you're designing a new numerical method. You want to find a, a method that causes the total variation to either remain the same, so the total variation of the function at time two is less than or equal to the total variation of the function at some, say, initial time. Okay, so if the, if the method is total variation diminishing, this is what I mean. It either stays the same or it decreases. And there's a theorem that tells you, um, that's by, uh, done by a man named Harton, who developed some uh, general guidelines or, well, they're mathematical conditions on, on, the, on the numerical stencil and the coefficients that tell you if your scheme is total variation diminishing. If we come back to this problem with the slopes, I can kind of imagine that if I did my slopes in this way, my total variation would increase. And so, using the notion, the idea of total variation diminishing, there's a new way we could calculate the slope. I'll write the slope as um, sigma. So the slope at, this, this is say point I here, the slope of the line at sigma i, I might write it as this. I'll just give you one example. There are four or five of these different um, uh, methods. Um, what I do What I do is I define a new function called the min mod. Well, actually, let's start at the line above. What I do is I look at this, if I want to calculate the slope, the first thing I do is instead of using these two neighbors only, I calculate the slope between those two points and the slope between those two points. Okay, so I, I do one-sided slopes. Okay, and then I put them into this function called min mod. This is what min mod does. Mid mod checks to see if A and B have the same sign. If A and B have the same sign, I choose the smallest of the two. If they have opposite signs, I choose zero. What that does is um, when I come back here and I think about doing a min mod slope, I might have a slope that's negative here, right between those two points. Um, I probably, anyway, I meant to, anyway, this slope here was meant to be kind of upright and I'm going increasingly up, but whatever. I wanted to have a kind of a positive slope right there. 
because these two slopes have opposite signs, instead of having this type of reconstruction, I would have zero because the slopes have opposite signs. And so now, for that top point, my reconstruction would be zero. It would have zero slope. And now it would look like this, and I wouldn't get that big spike that I saw before. And again, when I come down to do this point here and put that through MinMod, it will tell me to reconstruct that in a f like this. Okay? And so that eliminates the spurious oscillations that can occur near a discontinuity. Uh huh. I'm sorry, I, with the noise, I can't hear very well. No, I'm asking in the calculating total deviation. Uh huh. Taking the modulus to avoid negative Mm hmm. So, is the same go through if you take the square Um, I, I, I think, yeah, I think you would get something similar, but, um, this is what they were able to prove the theorems with, and so that's what's why it's used. Uh, there are different, anyway, so this is one example of how a TVD method helps me and more intelligently choose a slope that avoids oscillations near the shocks that I wa want to kill completely. Um, there are other methods, other techniques, or I mean so other s ways to calculate the slope. This is a uh, one that kind of keeps things fairly flat. There are other schemes that, for example, compare the one-sided slopes to the, to the total slope and, and uh, make sure that, you know, again, they're not changing signs and stuff like that. Um, but anyways, uh, in the tutorial, I'll give you some of them and you can put them into your code for evolving Berger's equation as one way to improve the reconstruction. So you'll do this piecewise linear reconstruction, but we'll use TVD methods to, to do, choose the slopes and not just guessing, you know, a simple analytic expression. Okay. Um, now, there's one caution I need to say. When I wrote down the good enough technique and I said the solution was n plus 1 is un i minus minor numerical fluxes, which are uh, dependent on a left state and a right state, i plus 1 half minus i minus 1 half, again, depending on a left and a right. Um, and divided by a delta x and multiplied by a delta t. When I wrote this down, and if we were to try to go ahead and use this, actually, you know, do this extra work, plug it into this equation, it actually wouldn't work very well. And the reason why is because these numerical fluxes we just approximated as these simple integrals. And, and that is true if I have piecewise constant states, because that's the real Riemann problem. But if now I give you something like this, this is not quite the Riemann problem anymore. And so I actually need to change things around. And I'm not, there's a way to do it, which I'm not going to tell you because it's a secret, no. Um, I'm not going to mention it because I'm going to take care of it in a different way. Um, but there is a way that you can go ahead and basically what you need to do is do a better approximation for the time integral to account for the fact that these aren't constant states anymore. They're a little bit different. Um, but we'll come to that here in a moment. So I'll put it here. It also takes care of my reconstruction issues. Okay, um, so that's one way that we can improve good enough method. By doing this reconstruction, I improve the spatial order of accuracy. When I reconstruct with the constant states, I get first order accuracy in space. If I reconstruct with linear states, I get second order accuracy in space. And if I go even further and I imagine doing parabolas or something, um, I don't know what they'd look like exactly, but if I imagine reconstructing with parabolas, um, this is called the piecewise parabolic method. So piecewise, I'm putting a parabola in everywhere. 
then I can get uh, third order in space. And if I go to higher order reconstructions, I, I increase the order of accuracy. And, um, and again, when I reconstruct with parabolas, you have to make sure that you don't get oscillations and there's some, you know, it's a fairly complicated algorithm, but, um, but it works very well. And that's what we use in our fluid code now is um, if you were to write a research quality, research grade relativistic fluid code, you would, you would reconstruct at least with parabolas and maybe higher to get the level of accuracy that you need. Um, so that's, anyway, it's a nice thing to know that with the Riemann problem, you can improve on, I'm sorry, with good enough method, you can improve the reconstruction. And by doing some extra work, you improve the accuracy, and that's, that's what you want to do. Because then if your code is, you know, third order accurate, then you double the amount of work, or you, or you at least, it's more than double, but anyway, if you, uh, if you double the number of points, then you get, uh, the error goes down by a factor of eight. Now there's a caution here um, with convergence. When I talk about convergence in this way, I mean only convergence for smooth solutions. If I have a discontinuity like this, um, all of these methods reduce to first order at the discontinuity. And it's the reason they, they reduce to first order so that they don't get oscillations in them. But the numerical method gives you something that looks like that, like the first order. So by a discontinuity, all t methods will reduce to first order. But at least where the solution is smooth, you get higher order. And it's problematic to define even what you mean by convergence at a discontinuity, because the whole notion of convergence requires differentiability, right? I'm sure Sasha probably maybe derived that for you. And um, the Richardson ex expansion that is done to calculate convergence requires differentiability, which does not exist at the discontinuity. And so while convergence is a very important tool and it's essential in designing uh, your numerical schemes, for fluid codes, it's in practice can be hard to test because you need to have a smooth solution and you want to evolve them for you know, a good amount of time to make sure that everything you know, stays convergent. And when you do that, then you get a shock on your code and then everything goes to first order. And so it can be difficult to, or tricky to test, but it's good to test to make sure that it works. But just be prepared that if you see a shock, you will get first order convergence. Okay, um, let me see, is this a good time for a break or I have to remember what I'm doing. Okay, approximate Riemann solvers. Uh, there are different ways to do approximate Riemann solvers. There's basically two ways. One is uh, simplify make some simplifying assumptions about your Riemann problem. I'll give you a couple of examples. So in the Riemann problem for a perfect fluid, or for a fluid, we might have a shock, we might have a discontinuity, we might have a, con uh, I'm sorry, a refraction wave, right? Something complicated like this. And when you go through and solve the Riemann problem, one of the complications is you're constantly checking as you iteratively solve whether one wave is what type of a wave it is, and uh, that's part of the difficulty. You can simplify things if you just say, well, let's just pretend that everything's a shock with a contact discontinuity. So just throw out the refraction wave, replace it with a shock wave, um, and, and see if that works. Remember, we're only going to take one point in the end. We're only going to take the solution right here. And so if we pretend that this is a shock, that might be a faster way to calculate it. And in the end, maybe it doesn't matter because I'm just going to take that point right there anyway. Now the solution will be approximate. It won't be the exact right value, but it will probably be pretty close. Another way is you replace it with everything with refraction waves and a contact discontinuity. And again, what you're doing here is you're just kind of speeding up. You're, you're removing some logic where you're constantly checking to see, do I have a shock? Do I have a refraction wave? You're just going to say, I'm going to say it's always the same thing. I only have one set of equations that I have to solve, and it can be a little bit faster that way. Um, it still can be a lot of work for relativistic problems, and so 
This isn't a technique that we often use. The second way is to basically throw away the Riemann problem for your real set of equations and find a related problem that's easier to solve. So you find a new problem that's close to what you've got that's easier to solve. Okay. Um, this technique is the way what we basically use. Okay. One example I, I already kind of hinted at was say, okay, this is the real problem I'm trying to solve. Right? This nonlinear conser conservation equation. Well, let's just pretend that at every point where I have to solve a Riemann problem, I linearize the equations. So it turns into that. Actually, let me rewrite that a little bit. If, if I took all these derivatives ex exactly, these two expressions would be analytically equal to one another. But I'm going to make an assumption here. I'm going to assume that A is a constant coefficient matrix that depends on the neighboring states so that I can use the Riemann problem I just talked about for linear systems to solve it. And so this is one of my assumptions. And again, if my points are close together, I can imagine that the difference between them in some sense can be linearized and that just this linear difference is what propagates maybe one way or the other in a Riemann problem. And so this is a one technique where we take the problem that's hard to solve, we replace it with something close treating A as constant coefficients here, not as the full Jacobian, um, and then solving the linear Riemann problem. And if I do that, I get a technique that's called Rose method or Rose Riemann, approximate Riemann solver. It's one of the uh, most commonly used approximate Riemann solvers in fluid dynamics. Uh, there are some variations on it, but um, it works very, extremely well. For, for what it does. It has very sharp features. It maintains sharp shocks. I don't know if you remember, but I showed you a highly relativistic uh, um, solution to a Riemann problem where the shock wave had a density that looked something like this, right? I guess I actually went like this. Anyway, it was a very narrow shock. That's hard to represent numerically. Normally, your numerical solution will look like that. Well, the row method is good at, you know, getting something closer to that maybe. Okay, it's a very nice technique. Um, it can be expensive to use because it requires me to know the eigenvalues of my equations. It requires me to know all of the eigenvectors for my equations and the inverse matrix, right? I make a vector, a, a matrix out of eigenvectors and I have to invert it as well. These are sometimes called the left eigenvectors, the matrix of whose rows are the left eigenvectors. Um, for relativistic fluids, these are hard to compute. And especially if you go into uh, relativistic MHD, you have eight equations then. You have the five fluid variables plus three components of the magnetic field. You have lots of degeneracies, you know, if the magnetic field goes to zero, then you really go back to the um, original, you know, set of fluid, five variable set of equations. Um, they're expensive to solve and difficult to use. And so in 3D relativistic fluid codes, um, most people do not use this technique, even though it works extremely well. It's just very expensive numerically. Remember, we have to solve these Riemann problems between every set of points. And if you have a three-dimensional grid, you know, you have n cubed points. And so you have many, many Riemann problems to solve. And you need to make it efficient. And this is a, a complicated scheme because at every point, you've got to calculate eigenvectors, the inverse of those eigenvectors, and then do all these operations to calculate characteristic variables and so on. Um, it, as I said, this, the method works very well, um, but we don't use it very often.
This is a different way, a different approach, and this is one that is commonly used in um, research codes in relativity. And this is called the HLL method, or the HLLE, or H, anyway, there's a kind of a family of them that have small differences between them. There's a version for MHD that's got some other HLM, I don't remember what it is. HLL stands for the three people who developed it, um, Harton, Van Leer, and, no, I can't remember, Lax, I don't remember. Um, but anyway, so it's an initial and for their names. I'm not, we're, and uh, they're basically shocks. These are both shocks. And so now my Riemann problem, I have a left state, I have a right state, and I have some star, I have a single state in between, two shocks, and one state that's in between. So that's the simplification in the HLL problem. Then you say, okay, well, what should the star state be? I've, I've thrown away some of the physics here, right? I've thrown away this contact discontinuity. I've gone from, you know, um, four states or two states behind the nonlinear waves to one. And they basically say, find u star by conservation. So we've kind of thrown the physics away, and so you say, well, how do I find u star now? Well, what we do is we just find u star by conservation. You integrate the solution at this time, you integrate the solution at that time, okay? And I have to tell you where these are, I forgot that. The HLL method requires me to know the maximum eigenvalue and the minimum eigenvalue. So I don't need to know all five of them anymore. I only need to know the, the two extremes. If I know the minimum eigenvalue and the maximum eigenvalue, I can find that distance right there. And when I integrate at some later time, I'm going to demand, I'm going to choose U star to make sure that it's conservative. So that's the, the way that I solve this problem, okay? Um, there's a complication that comes up. Well, first of all, I can tell you what that state is. We're not going to derive it because <coughs> that's too long. I'm trying to find where I wrote it down on my notes here. Um, so you can show fairly easily just by doing these two integrals and equating them that this is uh, lambda max times the right state minus lambda min times the left state plus f evaluated with the right state minus, oops, plus, that's a plus minus f evaluated on the left state, divided by lambda max minus lambda min. So that's what this average state turns out to be. Um, so you might say, well, the numerical flux, right? We know how good enough methods work. I need to calculate the numerical flux. All I need to do is figure out if my, um, you know, eigen my characteristic speeds are to the left or right, or if they're split like this. And if they're split like this, I need to evaluate, you know, maybe I would say this is U HLL, the flux evaluated with its average state. It turns out that's not right. Um, there's another conservation problem that comes in here. I, I chose this state here by demanding that I had conservation at this point. But if you demand that you have conservation over the entire grid at the solutions of all the Riemann problems, you come up with a slightly different condition. And I, I'm not going to derive that, but I'll just tell you that the real numerical flux for the HLL method is
Oops. Okay, that's the numerical flux for this configuration right here. If both of the characteristics look like this, then the numerical flux would just be F on the left state. If both of them are tilted the other way, it would be F of the right state. But when they're split like this, this is how I have to calculate the numerical flux. Now notice what's different here. When I worked with the row method, I didn't write it down, but I we saw how this, you know, this system of linear equations worked. We talked about the fact I need to know for relativistic fluids, I need to know all five eigenvalues. I need to know five eigenvectors and the inverse of five eigenvectors. Okay, that's a lot of information to calculate. If I use the HLL numerical flux, what do I need to know? I only need to know two eigenvalues, the minimum and the maximum. This is much easier to use because the eigenvalues for numerical relativity can be written down very simply. They're, they're expressions that have a square root in them and stuff, but they're basically the equivalent to the Newtonian ones. V plus sound speed, V minus sound speed. And in special relativity, it's, you know, it's the usual extension. What is it, B, C, S, something, I don't anyway. You know, you're just, it's the relativistic addition rule. So, um, we know what these are. And, in, and even in general relativity, they're easy to calculate. And so this numerical flux is actually easy to use. I only need to know two eigenvalues, nothing else from the characteristic problem. And of course, I'm evaluating the fluxes on the left and the right states, which I get by doing a slope, you know, uh, a reconstruction. And so this method is actually very cheap computationally. And this is the one that most people use in, in research codes. Um, it is a little more diffusive than the row method, you know, so if I had a really strong shock, the row method might give me something like that. HLL might give me something a little bit more like that. You know, but I can live with that. Because uh, there aren't, you know, there might be two or three extra points in here. Um, but for this speed, it gives me a fairly good solution. And, and you know, when I, I can use other things like adaptive mesh refinement to get resolution where I need it on the shock or something. So if I really want to get that, I can use other things that work faster than doing a full characteristic, cal you know, calculation with the row method. So this is the type of flux that we use um, in, in our research codes. Okay. Um, so that kind of covers it for approximate solvers. So I said we basically go this route, find a new problem that's easier to solve. This one was really easy to solve, and it leads to a method that works well and is cheap to use. So now we can move on to how do we put everything together. We've been looking at this equation. My GR, my relativistic fluid equations, say in two dimensions, are going to be more complicated. They're going to look something like this. So for one thing, I'm going now from one dimension to two. So I'm assuming that F is my flux function as before for uh, things where I take a derivative in the x direction. Then I have a second flux function, g, that has a derivative in the y direction. And if I had three dimensions, I'd have one more here. And then in addition, I have geometric source terms that can be very complicated, okay, that come from the geometry and the way the geometry is changing in time. And so 
I want to know how to handle this. There are, there's a technique called operator splitting, um, which is one way to approach this. But the technique that we use is called the method of lines. And I think Sasha talked, did Sasha talk about method of lines? Yeah, so we actually use the method of lines to do this. The method of lines takes care of multiple problems at once for us. So remember that in the method of lines, what I do is I discretize in space first, and I keep time an analytic derivative. Okay, and then I'll dis discretize in time later. And so I'll write something like I have a numerical flux in x and j minus i minus a half j over delta x with a minus sign and a delta t. And I'll have a minus delta t over delta y and a g i j plus a half. I think my handwriting is going downhill by the end of the week here. I don't know, maybe it looks as bad as it always did. And then finally, my source term is going to have a delta will be added on here as S of U. Okay, so I'll discretize in the space first. Notice that when I did my discretization, I did it dimension by dimension. So I I discretized in X, pretending that all the Y stuff was constant. Then I discretized in Y, pretending all the X stuff was constant. So this is called dimensional splitting. I'm splitting the X direction from the Y direction. More elaborate tech methods actually combine them together. And with relativistic fluids, we try to stay as simple as possible. The simplest thing that works because um, it's hard enough. Um, but anyway. Dimensional splitting does have some issues, but it's what we use. Now, notice, now I'm going to choose an integrator for this, for the time derivative. And I'm going to choose something like RK2 or, well, let's just say I could choose something like RK2. I actually won't but I would choose some Runge-Kutta type algorithm to do the integration in time. And so this turns into a multiple step method, right? Where I, because in Runge-Kutta 2, I'll make a prediction and then I'll um, calculate a final value. And so I'll have to calculate all the numer numerical fluxes twice. And so it turns it into a multi-step method. Um, I can improve the numerical fluxes by just adding the slopes on. By using this technique, I don't need to do anything complicated with my, numeric, with my numerical flux integrals. And I can just say that UL is, you know, uh, I is UI plus one half delta X times the slope at point I. And U right is UI plus one minus one half delta X, the slope at I plus one. Anyway, so I, I can go ahead and I can evaluate these numerical fluxes using slope limited type um, methods and I can just integrate in time. And it does everything for me. It handles the new way I'm doing reconstruction. It handles the different dimensions and it handles the source terms. It does all of those things for us. It doesn't come with any con you know, bad consequences. So method of lines is what everyone uses for integrating the equations in time. I said I wasn't going to use RK2. The reason why uh, is because, remember, we were careful at some point to use a TBD numerical scheme uh, for my spatial discretization. It helped me choose a slope that didn't cause oscillations. It turns out that RK2 does not preserve the TBD quality. And so if I integrate with RK2, I lose total variation diminishing from my scheme. And I don't want to do that because it, it's extra work, right? I don't want to lose it. So there, is a, there are classes of schemes. I'll just say that they're T 
TVD RK, RK methods um, that preserve this uh, feature. So I have to be careful. The main point here is you have to be careful in your time integrator. You can't just choose one off the shelf. You have to make sure that it's a TVD RK integrator. Uh, for a second order scheme, there's one called Tunes method that is, preserves the TVD quality, not the classical RK2. Anyway, so that's um, our, the considerations that go into doing time integration. I think we just have a few minutes left. And so I want to kind of give you an idea of how you, everything gets now put together. And let's imagine that we're writing now a fluid code. Well, when I first start out, I have to figure out what the equations are. And so I, if you look at the review articles that I uh, gave you as references, you can look in there. You can find the equations for GR fluids, general relativistic fluids. Uh, you can find uh, the eigenvalues, uh, the eigenvectors for perfect fluid without, um, you know, you can find all this information in those review articles. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to find that stuff. Uh, then you're going to look at the geometry and you're going to write down the Einstein equations and you're probably going to start with the BSSN formulation for that, right? So, and then you start calculating things and you realize that it's really hard. There are hundreds and hundreds of terms that you have to do. So probably what you're going to do is you're going to type your equations into a program like Mathematica and you're going to have Mathematica generate the, the, the Fortran or C code for you. So the first step here is basically generate your equations and we use um, programs like Mathematica and so on. Um, there are some scripts that Sasha has been involved in writing that work very well for that. You put your equations in, you can even type them in kind of in tensor form, and then you run the script and it goes through, it calculates all the expressions and gives you <coughs> output that you can plug into a, a platform like Cactus. And the nice thing about it is the script doesn't make algebra mistakes or sign mistakes or factors of two, which are really hard to find, okay? So that's kind of the first step that you would do. Um, and that's maybe, anyway, that's kind of back in developing the code. Another thing you're going to need to worry about is where do I get my initial data from? Because as you've been talking about with Mark, we have to solve, and, and Thomas as well, you have to solve these uh, constraint equations. I'm just going to pretend that we have some simple initial data because we did that the first day and that was our sing single star. We're going to start off with just a single star, so maybe I have the, the uh, the code that you wrote on Monday, or yeah, Monday, and you generate the single star, you change it to maybe the BSSN variables and so on, and you read that into your code as your initial data. So I have geometric data and I have fluid data combined together. And then once I have my star read in, I can calculate any other variables I need. I'll, I'll need my conserved variables. You know, with TOV, we have pressure and density, you'll need to calculate momentum which is zero, you'll need to calculate um, uh, the tau or whatever, okay, your conserved variables for the evolution. Once I've got all of that in the code and it's ready to go, I'm now ready to start integrating in time. So I'm going to choose some type of a time integrator here. Um, usually in research codes we use a third order TVD runga cutta scheme. Um, so it's third order, it preserves TVD. The reason that we use a third order method is uh, when the fluid becomes very dynamic, the third order, the higher order scheme basically means that your, your time steps are a little bit smaller. It seems to be a little more robust than, than lower order methods. And uh, some people even go to a fourth order scheme here. Um, but you'll use something like a third or fourth Runge Kata method probably to, to do the evolution in time. Um, if you go back and remember how that works, that means that if I'm using a third order method, I'm going to have to evaluate the right hand sides like three times, right, at every point, and I'll update them. So we're solving Riemann problems at every single interface three times for every time step. So that's, again, part of the necess necessity of being efficient here. Um, so I'm to 
use my right hand, my runga cutter method, I'm going to need to calculate my right hand sides. Now, when I say calculate right hand side, I mean the right hand side of the semi discrete equation where I had du dt equaled, you know, derivatives in x, f minus f over delta x, plus whatever the sources are, plus the other dimensions, okay? So this is what I mean by the right hand side, it's everything over here. I'm going to have to go through that, calculate it three times. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reconstruct all the variables using whatever technique I choose. Um, I would start off using constant reconstruction. When you build your fluid code, you'll find that you want to take baby steps because it's hard and you make lots of mistakes. And you're going to start off with the easiest thing that you can possibly do, run it and make sure it's right, and then you add your improvements slowly. Um, so you would maybe start off with constant reconstruction and then you move to linear reconstruction and if you want to do, um, <coughs> you know, and then you want to go to at least uh, parabolic reconstruction, PPM, if you choose to do that or you can choose, um, there are other classes of methods that aren't TV, well anyway, there are other methods that are higher order and they're out there. So the first step in calculating my right-hand side is to go through and reconstruct all my variables in one dimension. And then I'm going to solve my Riemann problem everywhere, which means basically calculate a numerical flux. And the common one to choose here is the HLL numerical flux because it's easy. It only requires me to know the eigen, two eigenvalues, the min and the max, and um, everything else is done. Once I have my reconstructed states, I just calculate them very quickly. I go through and I the entire grid and I calculate all of those fluxes. And then I'm going to go ahead and do the, um, am I skipping something? I wrote these down in case I forgot how to do this on my own or how to solve my own code. Now I can't find the paper. Well, if I've forgotten something, I'll find it again here. I'll figure it out. <laughs> I reconstruct. I calculate a numerical flux. I'm now going to update the conserved variables. How do I do that? That's basically one step of Runga Kutta. I know everything on the right-hand side. I calculate. Oh, sources. I didn't say sources. See, I knew I was forgetting something. So let's make that a D and let's put a C in here, which is calculate my geometric sources. Um, once I calculate my geometric sources, then I can now do the update. And I'm going to update in time all the conserved variables. Then I'm going to apply the boundary conditions. Right, that's my outflow boundary condition usually, or if I have a one-dimensional problem with the star, maybe I have a, a reflection boundary at the origin. And then I'm going to do the dirty secret that no one tells you about and when they read papers hardly. Um, and that is <coughs> something went wrong. Well, check for unphysical solutions, I'll call it. That's a fancy way of saying fudge factor. What most people will call this is apply a floor. Okay, what is an unphysical solution? It's a solution where something unphysical has happened. The velocity has gone faster than the speed of light. The um, density has gone negative. The pressure has gone negative. Something bad has happened. Okay. Um, I haven't actually calculated those things yet. I've only got to the conserved variables. But I would go through now all those conserved variables and I would make sure that the densities are all above zero. These methods, even though they work nice, even though they're conservative and all of that, they can still give you the wrong answer because they're, in the end, a numerical approximation. And, and especially if I have the edge of a star and I have very diffuse fluid down here, this star starts to move and oscillate around. It's like a bus hitting a fly, and this fluid out here can go flying off at very high velocities, and I can calculate a negative density here. 
And so I need to go through and I need to basically make sure that all of my densities are above some minimum value. That's what I mean by a floor. I choose some minimum value and I'll fix it up. Then after I've got physical values for all my conserved variables, I'll go ahead and calculate the primitives. We try to fix it along the way. So what we do are we look for the, basically the conditions that D, the density is bigger than zero or some floor value, right? I choose some floor value and I say D has to be bigger than that. And if it's smaller, I just replace it with the value delta. And there's the tau is my energy and I'm gonna make sure that's bigger than, I don't know, some other delta maybe. And then I have to make sure, um, to make sure that the velocities are smaller than the speed of light there's a condition that you can derive in relativity that tells you that the momentum squared has to be smaller than the total energy squared. And I'll make sure that that condition is satisfied. The reason I have to do this is because if I don't, I'll get garbage here. And it's bad garbage. By garbage, I just don't mean a bad answer. I mean you'll get a nan or because you'll be taking the square root of c squared, 1 minus c squared, which is bigger than 1, or 1 minus v squared, I mean. So, once I have got at least physical conserved variables, I'll go ahead and calculate my primitive variables using a nonlinear solver. Um, this is usually a, bis a combined bisection Newton-Raphson solver. Um, I try to put a bound on the root, and if everything's nice, Newton-Raphson will find the solution immediately. If, this, if the root looks like this, then newton raphson will have a very hard time with that, but then I can, if I've got the root bounded, I can use bisection to find it. So Numerical Recipes has some, you know, kind of off-the-shelf solvers that switch between bisection and newton raphson which is faster to do that type of thing. Okay, so I calculate my primitive variables, and then I am done. I've got new conserved variables at the advanced time. I've got the boundaries taken care of. I've made sure everything is physical, and I've got now the primitive variables. I have now completed one cycle of the RK algorithm. And then I kind of go back up to here, and I do it all again, right? When I do my RK algorithm, then I'm going to go ahead and do all this again. And if it's a third order Runge kata, I'll do it all again. So I'll, do, I'll go through this cycle of number four three times in a third order Runge kata. Then, after I have now successfully found the solution at the next level of time, I might want to do some analysis to see what's going on. Oops, I forgot. Then I want to solve the Einstein equations. So I've got to do that at the same time, right? After I update the fluid equations, it's usually more convenient to update the fluid equations first because I need to calculate, along with the fluid stuff, I need to calculate T mu nu that I'll plug into the right-hand side of the Einstein equations. And then I might solve the Einstein equations using a technique, a different technique. Um, but it's still in my method of lines, overall method. But I'll have a different discretization in space for the Einstein equations, when appropriate for the Einstein equations. Um, so I'll update the Einstein equations too. Now I'm done with this step. And now we might want to do some analysis to see what's happening. For example, I might want to check to see if there's a black hole horizon anywhere. Um, you know, I might be evolving a, a black hole and a star, and I want to check to see where the black hole is. Or the, um, I, if I'm doing stuff with MHD, I might want to um, calculate some quantities. For example, am I preserving that the divergence of the magnetic field is zero? Um, I might want to calculate my constraints to see if I'm uh, solving, you know, if my system is a valid solution of the Einstein equations. Uh, and so on, but there might be different types of analysis that I want to do. Um, if I'm solving uh, for gravitational waves, I might have some things to do here to calculate gravitational waves on surfaces that I can then extract. So that's, and then once I'm done with that, I start all the come back over here and I do a new step of my Runge kata to evolve to the next time. But that's kind of hopefully an overview of how everything works together. 
from starting with the equations we did on Monday to um, using the Riemann solvers that we've talked about the past couple days, the primitive solver that we talked about, I think, Tuesday, I don't remember, and so on. But that's kind of how everything fits together. So if you want to start writing a fluid code, that's kind of this, at least the main modules or, or parts of the code that you'll think about and, and how to write them together. So that's all that I have, and I thank you for your attention, and we're done. And if you have any questions, or? Yes, so this would be from here. I didn't maybe do it quite anyway. So when I solve the third order Runge-Kata, that involves doing all of this stuff up to here for one step of the Runge-Kata algorithm. And I'll repeat that three times or two times, depending on the order of my time integrator. And when I have done that, then I'll get one full step. And I've gone from one hypersurface to the other. OK? So this also brings us to the end of this course also. Let's thank uh, David for an excellent set of lectures. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. It's been a very, it's been an exciting experience. So I'm happy to do it. Okay.